So preparing the build, this is where we get stuck into actually starting to build the system. <clears throat> so preparing the host system. So as it says in this chat, so the host tools needed for building LFS are checked and if necessary installed. And we'll create the partition on disk, the file system and mount it. So first thing, host system requirements. So this is the chapter I went to where I ran this little script in Endeavor OS to see if it was still capable of compiling Linux from scratch, which as you saw it was, or it is rather. Um, and this is why this chapter is so important. If you skip this chapter or you ignore the output from this chapter, then if you get errors, um, then you're on your own really because you've ignored this chapter. Um, now there is a chance that you can skip this chapter and everything will work fine. There is a small chance that will happen, happen but it's, it is unlikely. So if you have missed this chapter and you haven't checked that your system you've boot, booted into as the, like your live system, your host Linux, is not um, up to scratch, then um, yeah, you're going you're gonna to fail and you're not going to get much help at all because you're basically ignoring uh, the instructions of the book. Um, so it tells you what are the minimum versions of the packages that are required here. So all these packages need to exist and they need to have a version that's newer than equal to or newer than what's printed. Although it does say some earlier, uh, sorry, it will say later versions, sorry. Yeah, here, for example, GCC versions greater than 12.2 are not recommended uh, as they've not been tested. So the reason why they mentioned that version is because that's the version of GCC that gets installed in this version of Linux from scratch. And obviously, they've not tested anything later because it doesn't exist at the moment or it's un unstable. So it's best to stick to the versions that are, are mentioned. So the best thing to do, easiest thing to do, is to copy this script and paste it into the terminal. So I'm doing this as root. It shouldn't really matter too much whether it's the root or the user that does this. And what we need to do now is just to double check what versions are printed with what versions are required. So we'll start with bash. Okay, this is just something that's been printed out that looks a bit messy. It's probably something to do with the way I've copied and pasted um, the text in for that script. So you can ignore that. The first line that you want to look for, in fact, it would be nice if this script did have a sort of header to identify where the first line of output would be, would appear. That would be quite good. Um, for example, some uh, lines, so if I was to modify it, something like this would be good if it had like echo, or maybe not on that line, if you've got an export, maybe something like this, just something simple like this would be good, because then when we run the script, you can see straight away where we need to start concentrating on the output. So, by doing that, it's helped me. So, you might want to do that yourself. Just modify the script slightly so you can identify exactly where to start looking. But you can see the bash output, the bash version is the first one we want to look at. And we've got version 5.1.16. You can see that anything greater than 3.2 is what is required. And it also says that bin sh should be a symbolic or hard link to bash. And you can see it's printed that up, it's found that. So that's exactly what is needed. Bin utils 2.13.1. We've got 2.38, so that's fine. <coughs> Bison 2.7. <coughs> Excuse me.
Right, excuse me, just have a coughing fit. <clears throat> uh, right, yes, yeah, so Bison 2.7, 3.82. Call your tills, we need 6.9 or more. We've got 8.32. Diff utils, 2.81, we've got 3.8. Find, find your tills, 4.2, we've got 4.9. Gork. So this is important, it should be Gork, not any other type of Orc. Um, certain distributions have other, other Orcs, um, and they're not good enough. It does need to be Gork. There are slight differences between different versions, so this needs to be the GNU version. Um, so you can see we've got the correct version. We've got 5.1.1. All that's required is 4.1, but also there's a symlink to Gork required, which we've got, so that's okay. Again, if you're using another distribution that is one that doesn't use Gork, you will need to install Gork yourself, not, not use the default one. GCC 4.8, we've got 11.3, so that's okay. Uh, same with G++. <coughs> Grep 2.51, We've got 3.7, gzip 1.3, we've got 1.12, that's fine. Linux kernel 3.2, we've got 5.15. Um, it says there's a reason why there's a requirement there. And if it is earlier than 3.2, which is probably very unlikely these days, then you need to update it. M4, need 1.4, we've got 1.4.19, okay, so it's 1.4.10, so that's fine. Make 4.0, we've got, where are we, 4.3. Patch, we need 2.5.4, we've got 2.7.6. Perl, we need 5.8.8, .8. we've got 5.34, so that's fine. Python, we need 3.4, we've got 3.10. Uh, Said we need 4.1.5, and we've got 4.8. Tar 1.22, we've got 1.34. Text info 4.7, and we've got 6.8. And XZ 5.0.0, we've got 5.2.5. And there's one final test there that checks that the G compiler works okay, and you can see it does. Um, one package that almost always is not installed on many other distributions is the text info package. So that's probably another one that you'll need to install. And there may be other packages. I think Bison one is one that's quite often not installed. Um, and as you can see, this is why I recommend Endeavor OS and Gen 2 because there's nothing else to do. We're set to go and start on with the process of building Linux from scratch. So again, this covers in a little bit more detail now what's um, going to be done in each of the chapters. Um, so the first few chapters are accomplished on the host system, which is what we're in at the moment. This is what you're looking at is the host live USB or live CD, as they still call the host name um, that I've booted. We're not, we haven't run off the disk. This is all run off the USB stick. It's been loaded into memory and everything's been run out of memory or nearly everything, it will still refer to the USB to load the stuff up. As I say, I think the UEFI boot uh, has got an option to load everything into the memory, so you can unplug the USB if you so wish. Chapter 5 to 6, um, this is where we mount a partition where we're going to build stuff and um, put stuff, everything, everything we create into, and we create a user called LFS, and then chapter 7 to... 10 is where we actually build the final um, system proper. In fact, this chapter 8 where the um, most of the building is done and then the remaining chapters of configuration, chapters 9 and 10. So the first thing we need to do is to create a partition. This gives you some general uh, ideas of what needs to be done. Um, and what you might want to create in terms of partitions. 
it doesn't give you any details because there's so many options it's down to you what you want to do so what I should do is um, I'll just pause the book there and work on the terminal myself and show you what I'm going to do to replace the Windows system we've got on the hard disk. So the first thing I'm going to do is a command called fdisk with a parameter minus L which lifts all the disks and the partitions that are on the disks. So you can see we've got several uh, pieces of information output here. We've got a loop device, we've got a dev SDA device here and we've got a dev SDB device. Now the SDB device is the USB stick that I've booted from. So we don't want to touch that and the loop device is what's created um, to create this environment we're in. So that's a file, that'll be a file that's on the dev SDB device. So we don't want to touch, touch those two. The disk that's actually inside the machine is this disk here, this light on disk. So that's the one I want to be dealing with. And as a further hint to show that it's the correct disk, you can see that these are HPFS stroke NTFS or XFAT partitions. Um, so that indicates that these are the Windows partitions of the Windows 10 that you saw at the beginning of the videos. So they're what I want to replace. So there's several ways we can wipe this disk. We can do a format which is probably a bit over the top really because we're going to be overwriting stuff anyway. Um, we can wipe the disk signatures um, or the, sorry the partition signatures on the disk or we can go into fdisk slash def slash sda and if I do m for menu you can see there's an option there to delete partitions so if I do p for print we can do delete enter and delete them that way and now if I do p for print you can see it's blanked it out the only thing is it's still got the original um, disk identifiers and you might want to reset that in case there's anything in maybe the BIOS that recognizes that or you know something else that recognizes that so you might want to initialize that from scratch which you can do in, in uh, fdisk but there's a quick way of doing this you can use a tool called wipefs wipe file system which I believe is part of the um, you know I'm not sure what it's part of actually uh, it's either core utils or um, utils Linux um, packages so what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this tab and go back to the LFS page right and I'm actually going to download this because I said I would in case my um, internet disappears and I'm going to download this no chunks um, file which is really useful to have because A I'll get the whole manual in one web page so that's really useful for as I say if my internet goes I've got the whole manual here if I go to the end you can see there's the end of it there which is um, looks like part of the appendix actually yeah it shows well this is the bit I actually wanted to use because I was going to look up for look up wipefs to see what package it's part of um, there's a uh, yeah there's the index there so um, yeah you can see it's the whole manual that that's there that's really good but also you can search for stuff so I'm going to search for wipefs and there you can see straight away it's come up with util linux so I know straight away that wipefs is part of the util linux package like I say I wasn't sure if it was part of core utils or util linux um, and you can see there's three matches so I bet one of those matches is that appendix right at the very end after um, the in, uh, yeah the index uh, you can see there's a description of what the program does um, but more importantly there's a bit that specifically says it is part of util Linux so this should be because it's part of util Linux this should be on any distribution and if it's not then 
uh, you know, you can either install, try and install YPFS or install Util Linux on the distribution you're on. But YPFX FS takes a couple of parameters. The important ones we're going to be using is the A, the all option to wipe all the uh, what they call magic strings. And these are the signatures that indicate. So if you imagine a disk, at, at somewhere on the disk, there's a, like a table of contents which lists what partitions are on disk. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to wipe the table of contents. So it means that the disk still holds all the data about those partitions and what's on those partitions. So it does mean Windows will still be on the partition, but we won't be able to access it anymore because we'll have wiped the contents. There's no way to look into where those are. And we'd have to use some sort of recovery or forensic uh, software to recover that information if we needed to. And we're also going to use a another option here, minus N, which is the no action option. And it says do everything except the actual write. So what this will do, it will uh, emulate, or it, it will do everything except for, as it say, the actual changes to the disk. So it will let us um, verify that um, we're on the right disk and we're, the results that come up are what we expect to see. So if I do F disk minus L again, these are the three partitions I would expect to be printed out when I run the YPFS command. Rather than printing up all the disk all the time, we can do minus L slash dev slash SDA. And sometimes it's easier and safer to double click this here and center click to copy and paste that to ensure there's no typos. If I accidentally typed, say, slash dev slash SDB, I'd use I'd lose the live boot disk and that could cause problems. So sometimes better to copy and paste. <clears throat> so you can see by running that command I just get the information for this particular disk that we're interested in, the hard disk that's in the machine. If I clear the screen and run that command again. Just so we don't see all the other stuff. So now I'm going to do the wipe fs command again. And as I say, I want to do minus n because I don't want to make any changes to just yet. And I want to do the minus a. So you can either do minus n minus a or you can do minus na. It doesn't matter which. Oh, and of course, you've got to tell it the device. So again, I'm just going to paste in slash dev slash sa uh, sda. And you can see it's shown us what it would do. It's going to erase a DOS partition and two GPT partitions. And it's got the um, signatures there. Oh, sorry, the offsets. So I guess if you were to calculate what this hex number is in decimal, it would probably come up with this number here, I guess. And we can do... Um, No, we can't do anything else. That's just about all we can do to verify that that's the correct partition. There's three partitions. We're on SDA, so that's fine. I'm happy that's the right disk. So all I do now is recall the command, delete the N for the sort of milk run command. You know, do everything except for the right. This time I'm going to do the right. And you can see it's produced exactly the same output. So there's no um, no indication that we've actually done the right. Apart from if we do F this minus L now, you can see it's actually blank. So the, the right has actually worked. And we can again validate or verify that by rerunning the YPFS command. There's no output this time. So you can see that that disk has, has definitely had its... Um, table of contents, if you like, erased. So now I'm going to run fdisk again without the minus L command. And you can see that it, it says it does not create a partition table. It's created a new label for me. Um, and it's told me the identifier it's given it. And what we need to do now to show you the mem menu 
there's various options here for dealing with partitions and we'll do option N to add a new partition which is just here and in fact if I do P to print the partition table you can see that again it says there's nothing there there's that disk identifier it says it's created for us do N for a new partition don't want primary or extended I want a primary default and the first partition I'm going to create is the boot partition and it's a good idea to create a separate boot partition because generally you wouldn't have this mounted by default you'd mount it manually and that's a bit of security in case something um, trashes your main file system you, you'll still have a boot partition with the kernel in it to boot from and you may be able to do some recovery work to recover your main file system so we'll accept the first sector and I want to give this a size I don't know how many sectors it is so I'm going to give this a say 256 megabytes size capital M uh, it's warned me that there's an NTFS signature there so do I want to remove the signature so you can see that that YPFS has just removed the bare minimum it's, uh, it's probably just removed those magic numbers and left everything else there do I want to remove it? Yes, I do. So it hasn't actually removed it. It'll only remove it when I do the right command, which is what I'll do at the end. If I do P now to print the table, you can see there's this new um, partition I've created, which is going to be my boot partition. And I've got a message there saying that the signature on partition one will be wiped uh, when I write these changes. So the next thing I'm going to do now is to create a swap partition. So new primary again, default next partition number, first sector, let's use the next one. How big do I want it to make now? Swap partition is a bit of a moot point. Uh, well, not a moot point, actually a bit of a debatable point. It used to be a case of allocate twice as much memory as you got now, but computers have got so much memory these days that's a bit ridiculous. However, there is an exception to that. If you intend to have an installation where you want to use the Hibernate facility, the way the Hibernate works in Linux, it's not like Windows where it uses up some of your valuable disk space. The Hibernate in Linux will actually use the swap partition to write the Hibernate, Hibernate file to because the swap partition is not needed uh, when it's in hibernation. So that's quite a good way of saving disk space. Therefore, you need to, that is where you do need to create a swap space at least as big as the amount of memory that you've got on the system. So, on this machine, I've got 16, megabyte, uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. I'd need to create a swap space of at least 16 gigabytes if I wanted you to, to use Hibernate. However, I don't want to use Hibernate. 16 gigabytes is quite a reasonable amount, especially as this CPU's only got four cores. Uh, generally, when you're compiling, the biggest package GCC probably needs up to about two gigabyte per core, so we're looking at eight gigabytes. So therefore, sixteen gigabytes is going to be plenty of space uh, for GCC to work within. Therefore, uh, I'm only going to create a, a swap file of say two gigabytes, um, which even then is probably way too much. One gigabyte would probably be enough. Uh, but as I say, if you're intending on building a Linux from scratch system, going on to do Beyond Linux from scratch and have the machine capable of hibernating, you do need to create a swap file minimum, uh, at the absolute minimum size of your memory. You probably want to make it just a little bit bigger in case the allocator creates a partition that's just slightly smaller than what you give. So, for example, if I created 16 or told it 16 gig, the way the calculations work it might be just slightly less than 16 gig so you might want to do you know maybe 17 gig or uh, you know 1700 megabytes uh, 17,000 megabytes for example uh, just to be on the safe side so there you can see I've created my second partition which is going to be my swap I need to tell it to change that to the swap type so I do the option T to change the type it's partition 2 on a change which is the default one it's 
offering me, I'll accept that by pressing enter. You can do L if you don't know what the partition numbers are. And the one I want is 82, which is Linux swap. You can see there. So I'll type in 82. And you can see it says it's changed the type to Linux swap. And now if I do a print, you can see it's actually called Linux swap. And then lastly, I want to create the actual partition, which is the going to be the root partition for our new Linux system. So this will be everything apart from what's in the boot partition will reside in this root partition. So again, accept the default partition number three, accept the default first sector. And now because I want to use the rest of the disk, I'll just accept the default end. And you can see it's created a partition that's uh, 236 gig, which is near enough the whole of the disk. It's a, a 250 gigabyte. Uh, disk. So now if I do P for print, you can see this is the layout that I've selected. I've got a 266 meg small partition for the um, kernels. The boot partition grub will reside on there, the boot scripts for grub and so on. I've got a 2 gigabyte swap partition and finally a boot uh, root partition which will be used to hold the main Linux and Scratch system. So now all I need to do is to type in the W command to write those and that's it, that's final now. We've created a new structure on the disk and to confirm that let's do fdisk-1sl on the disk, the SDA and again you can see the partitions that we've created, the layout is the same as what we saw just before we um, wrote them and before we quit the fdisk. Uh, interactive uh, utility. So that's that part. So that's that part uh, done. So now what we need to do next is create some file systems. And it, again, it doesn't direct us exactly what to do. It just gives us hints. Um, and it says here to use this command to create an ext4 system. So we can do that. Now, um, there's <clears throat> one thing to know here, this partition is quite small and we could uh, just run this command on dev sda1 and again be careful what you type in here, you don't want to be overwriting your live USB or if you've got other disks in the system you don't want to be writing to the wrong disk so again it's quite uh, clever to double click the partition that you want to uh, format that you've printed, you know, you've printed on the screen like I've done here, and paste that in so that you don't risk any typos. For example, you could possibly format this, format another partition, but mistype, say SDA2, and type SDA1, and then you overwrite what you've just formatted. So it is a good idea to select and paste, copy and select, uh, copy and paste the partition names just to be double sure that you are doing the right ones. Now, as I say, you can run this command on that partition. Um, it's, what's it done here? Okay, so it's probably because the I don't normally verb, use the minus V option, which is the verbose option. It's actually telling us what it's going to be doing. Um, and it's saying that it already creates a boot sector on there and some details about it. Oh, now, interestingly, it's done something that I was going to demonstrate. Um, uh, let me do this anyway. So you can see it's uh, formatted that partition. Now, I was going to tell you that there's another option you might want to do here because the partition is so small, which is to specify that it is a small partition, but it seems that I don't think MakeFS used to do this. Um, I think you had to specifically tell it with the, uh, I think it's the minus capital T command, to tell it that you wanted to use it as a small partition. Um, yes, it's not come up with anything different. It's still come up with a small, so it looks like you don't need to do that. And it's, it's intelligently selecting the right type of ext4 so I'm not going to rerun that command, it's pointless. Um, 
yeah, you can just use the command that's in the book with the partition that you want to use. So if I list the partitions up again, we've formatted SDA, which is our boot partition, to ext4. Even though you can't see that at the moment, you saw the command ran here, these parts here. Um, so now I'm going to rerun the same command, but on SDA3, which is going to be our root partition, you'll see that the blocks and the numbers come up will be a lot, lot bigger because it's a bigger partition. So because it's an SSD, it's discarding blocks there. Just wait for that to complete. And you can see it's created a, a lot more super blocks. And oh, interestingly, it's still come up small there. Um, maybe that's just the default for ext4, maybe. <coughs> However, that's fine. Just accept the defaults. Um, they'll, they'll will be fine. There's no problems with that. So we've done the two ext4 file systems, which is SDA1 and SDA3. So now we need to format the swap partition. As you can see, they've kindly given us the command for that, which is just mkswap. I'll just copy that part, put a space in, and I'll copy and paste the partition name for that, which is dev SDA2. And that's really quick. It doesn't write much to that, apart from a quick signature as I can remember. And that's it. So that's all the file systems formatted. We're now going to move on and move on to something that's extremely important, which is the LFS variable. So this is an environment variable called LFS. And as it says, it's used several times. And this is here because that we're going to mount the partitions at a particular point in the file system and we want to ensure that we're consistently referring to that mount point all the time and to do that we need to use this environment variable and to ensure that we are pointing at this location we need to make sure this variable is set at all times because we're going to be switching between different users um, it is important to uh, make sure it's set uh, which is what this uh, boxes warning us here this caution so you will see me typing in an echo LFS every now and then just to make sure that it's set it is easy to forget to set it um, and I advise you to do the same if you're going to run a command that's got LFS the dollar LFS environment variable in it and you're unsure just do echo LFS before you run that command just to be sure because if you have not got the LFS variable set and you run the command there there is a real risk that you could trash your um, host Linux you'll have to reboot and restart again or if you are and this is not recommended if you are building Linux from scratch in a running Linux system which is quite possible I've done it myself it's not recommended because if you do not set that LFS variable you will trash your host system you will make changes to it and worse you, you could remove or delete stuff that will just trash your your um live system your 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 real system so that's why it's best to boot from a live cd and why it's best to keep checking that you have set this um lfs variable so let's set this up export lfs so the export command makes it available in uh, off the top of my head, if I remember correctly, um, in any spawned shells, if we just did LFS, I, if I remember correctly, that the variable is only available in the current shell. It won't be um, made available in any spawned shells. So it's important to use the export. And if we run the echo command, as you can see in that box there, echo dollar $LFS, you can see it's got something in it, which is the going to be the mount point. Um, and if we look at MNT, you can see that doesn't exist at the moment, that location. Um, but the next bit is we're going to create that. It does say you can add it to your bash profile, which is a good idea. It's a bit pointless here in this situation because we're in a live CD environment. As soon as we reboot the PC, 
any settings such as those in bash profile will be lost forever so it's a little bit pointless but if you are building on a a running linux system that you've got that would be a good idea because that would help prevent you forgetting to set it manually um, but if you do that re-log in and just do an echo lfs to make sure that the command you've put in to bash profile uh, has actually worked and it has actually run and that you've got uh, a result when you do echo dollar lfs so let's move on to mounting the new partition well we've got a couple of partitions or several partitions to two file systems to mount and one swap partition although again I doubt, I doubt very much if a swap partition will be used what you might notice is that maybe a couple of kilobytes will be used with the swap partition uh, and that's likely to be something that's running in the memory that hasn't been accessed for some time what the kernel does it identifies stuff that are in is in memory that's not being used and it will just swap it out to the swap partition because it's not been used and the idea is that it's allocating more memory for processes processes that are in use um, but yeah it's probably only going to be a you know a few k or tens of k or maybe 100k it won't be a great deal and i doubt very much with 16 megabytes in this machine that it will um, go anywhere near to filling that at all so let's run these commands now generally um, you can just copy and paste these commands by highlighting, highlighting them and pasting them in and that'll be fine but in a lot of these grey boxes where they've got the commands to copy and paste there are actually several commands and especially if this is the first time you've built LFS I recommend that you copy and paste individual commands and paste them and observe the output if you copy for example there's four commands in this one four separate commands if you were to copy and paste that the chances are that you might miss the output from maybe the first command it may appear under the last command and you wouldn't know which command it came from uh, there's a chance that might happen uh, some programs have a delayed output because they've started a process that runs in the background so that what that means is the output from that command won't appear immediately after that command it may be that while that's running another command runs and the output from the earlier command appears after the later command so it can be a bit misleading um, so as I say if you're new to Linux from scratch even if Linux is quite new to you I, I thoroughly recommend and I will be doing that uh, where I can remember I will be copying and pasting individual commands it's a bit more tedious it's a bit more work with the mouse but it's a lot lot safer and again you'll learn a little bit more because you'll see what the output of that command is specifically um, this, what I do here by the way is I highlight what there is to copy in Linux you don't need to copy and paste there's, there's actually two clipboards there's the I think one clipboard is part of the X windowing system and I think the other clipboard is part of the desktop environment, if I remember correctly. So the I think the X windowing system is the one that I'm using where you highlight the command. It gets put into temporary buffer automatically and then you paste that by center clicking the mouse. Or if you haven't got a center button, double clicking the two buttons on the mouse will also, yeah, it won't actually work here. It looks like it's being intercepted by KDE. Um, so the center click works to paste that in um, the other traditional way is to use the copy and paste command but obviously that's a lot more clicking so it's a um, a good way it's a faster way it does mean of course that if you highlight something else um, that whatever gets highlighted so if I highlight for example that word there uh, you have to remember that if something fills that buffer up that's what you're going to get not what's highlighted um, which which can happen so you might see me re-highlight something just to ensure that the buffer is actually full with what I want to paste so let's do this make there so what we're going to do this make the the minus p command creates any parent directories that might not exist in this case that doesn't matter because the mnt directory 
already exists. There's no intermediate directories, so it will just create the LFS directory because, as you can see, LFS contains MNT LFS. So the substitution will mean that this command will say make the minus PV forward slash MNT forward slash LFS. P is just for verbose. It will give us a bit more output. And that's the output you get. Normally with Linux commands, you don't get any output unless you request the output normally with a, a minus V, lowercase V command. So now if I do LS minus L MNT, you can see we've just created this LFS uh, directory here. And you can see there's the current time, 9.14. You can see down in the corner there, that's just been created. Now we've got to mount the partitions. <clears throat> Uh, we can't actually use this by itself. We've got to do something here because, again, the Linux from scratch book is not telling us explicitly what to do because that's down to us to decide how we want to create our Linux from scratch partitioning system. Uh, so we need to adapt what's here. This one's suggesting you might want to mount home from a different partition. Uh, so it gives an indication of what we've got to do here. Uh, well, our home is going to be part of the root partition, so we're not going to be doing that. But if you remember, I've created a separate partition for the boot partition, so we'll just ad adapt these commands. So we've already done the make the um, minus PV LFS. We don't need to rerun that. We need to run this command here. And as you can see, it's got the italics and the uh, angle brackets, which means we need to replace that. Uh, open bracket xxx close bracket with something else and what that is is the partition with the roots file system on which is going to be sda3 so all we need to do is have to press the right arrow to get rid of the highlighting left arrow to get up to there press backspace and type in or even delete all of that and double click this part here and paste that in. So what we're doing, we're mounting this partition, which is our root file system at the LFS point, which is, as you can see here, MNT LFS. And that's been created or mounted. So if I do DF minus H, you can see that that's now in the table of mounted file systems. There's the mount point and there's the partition that we've mounted. And you can see how much space has been used. That's probably just with the lost and found directory that gets created by default. And you can see there's 210 gigabytes available to use for us. Next thing I need to do is to create a directory for the boot partition to be, exist on the root partition. So I'll copy the part of this command here, but instead of home, we want to create a boot directory. You can see it's created that. So let's have a look at that. In fact, we can use the LFS directory. If I press tab there, okay, it won't work at the moment. I'll need to put a forward slash. Well, in fact, I can just do LFS on its own. You can see there's the lost and found directory for any files that get found. If we do a disk check and there's any corruption, they'll get put in there. But there's the boot directory I just created. So now we need to, if I do an FDS minus L, dev SDA, I need to mount the boot partition, which is this one here, into this location here. And to do that, I just adapt this last command. So we're not loading it or mounting it at the home, we're mounting it at boot. <coughs> And again, we need to replace this YYY part with the correct partition, which is, where is it here? Dev SDA one. So as you can see, this was still highlighted, but I've since highlighted something else. So I've had to re-highlight this partition name to ensure that I get the correct paste, correct data pasted. So you can see there that, um, I've pasted that in and what's going to happen, it's going to mount this partition with this file system type into the boot uh, directory that we've created. And that's successful. If I do DF minus H, 
and you can see now we've got a 230 meg partition 14k has been used got 214 megabytes available to use and although also if I do ls minus l lfs there's our boot partition um, and should be able to look inside that boot partition we won't see anything oops apart from the lost and found because it's a separate partition it's created a new lost and found directory for that partition so this lost and found relates to let's double click that relates to that partition and this lost and found relates to that partition so that's why we've got two separate lost and founds you can see they've got different timestamps on them okay so that's the file systems mounted and again it says resume that not be restarting the computer which I won't because I'm in a live file system if I do have to stop overnight then what I'll do is just put the machine to sleep so that it's not using well, hardly any electric and then I'll just resume it the next day um, and I won't have to set anything up and that's something I'd advise you doing you can shut down the machine restart again but depending on where you are in the process it can get a little bit uh, complicated and it's an extra opportunity for errors to creep in so it probably is better to um, put the machine to sleep and just come back the next day to carry on and indeed if you want to take a break for you know, a few hours you don't want to leave the machine on again just put it to sleep uh, which quite simple to do just click start and sleep here and that will put the machine to sleep and you can resume later on Finally, we need to activate the swap partition. So they've given us a command here to do that. And again, there's some data here we need to replace. So oops, that's the scroll button that's done that. So all we need to do is just replace this dev ZZZ with the correct partition, which is dev SDA2. Paste that in, and press enter. And you can see it says that it's found the swap signature. It's given some details about the swap size and so on because we've specified the v the verbose option and you can see it's done uh, the swap on so we don't look at that with df minus h because that's ordinary file systems to view that we can either do cat to catalog the proc file system and there's a virtual file name there called swaps and that shows us the current swap partitions that are active and what priority they've got or perhaps a little bit easier, we can type in the swap on command. And again, that shows us a similar amount of information um, in a slightly different layout. So we've got the name of the partition, what type of swap it is, because you can have swap files that exist within swap partitions, which are quite handy to have, but a swap partition is slightly faster as it's uh, one less layer uh, for the system to process. The size, how much is currently used, zero bytes at the moment, and the priority again, minus two. Okay, so that's the disks all set up, or the disks set up with all the partitions. 